Hello and welcome to this course about PLS, partial least squares regression. Um, this course is sort of trying to give a little bit of details on what PLS is. And it's meant for people who already have a user knowledge of uh, PLS, but want to understand some of the details uh, a little better. So we're going to talk about a number of different uh, subjects. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk a little bit about regression, because sometimes when you start using PLS, you, you may end up forgetting a little bit that it's really just a regression that we're doing. So we'll talk a little bit about what regression is, uh, basically. And then we'll continue and talk about what's wrong with the traditional uh, regression methods when we have very collinear data, when we use many variables and maybe not so many samples. And then we will look at how PLS can fix these problems uh, and talk a little bit about the concept of PLS, uh, how to understand PLS models. And especially then we'll talk about uh, how to understand and how to interpret the regression vector of the PLS model. We're also going to talk a little bit about validation, mainly about determining the number of components. Um, and we will uh, end off talking about how to use PLS for building classification models, PLSDA models. Um, so let's get uh, started and talk a little bit about what is uh, regression. Well, we can start by asking, uh, for example, in this fairly simple equation, it's not too difficult to figure out what b uh, would be. Uh, 2 times b equals 4, uh, so that's fairly easy to um, sort of guess what that should be. Now I made it uh, a little bit more complicated, not too much. Uh, the solution would still be the same. Um, but now we have several observations. And what I would like you to see is that we can actually arrange this in different ways. And it's important that you are familiar with these uh, different ways uh, so you don't get uh, frightened when you see different types of uh, notation. So for example, we can take all our observations and put them in a vector x. Uh, so that would be uh, these ones. So we can put them in a vector x and the same for the right hand side, the y, we can put that in another uh, vector uh, y, like this. So these are all just different ways of uh, saying the same thing. Uh, we can also put them in a little coordinate system if we would like to do that. Okay, um, so that's fairly uh, straightforward. But it could be that we didn't actually have perfect relations between x and y. Normally, we would have some errors. Uh, so let's say that instead of actually having just this relation, we have some small uh, residuals. That means that we do not have a perfect relation. So if I try to put all the samples uh, in a coordinate system, we can see that, let's say, let's take the first row. So in the first row here, x is 2, so that's this one, and y is 5, so that's this one. So I can plug in all my different samples here in this coordinate system of x versus y. And what we will see is that we cannot really get a perfect relationship anymore. So we can't find a b that will perfectly satisfy uh, all of this. We will have residuals. So for every sample, there's a deviation from the perfect line. And that means we cannot actually find a perfect solution. Well, what do we do then? Well, we'll try and find the one that minimizes the residuals as much as possible. So we try to make sure that the line is somewhat nice. So rather than having a line here or here, this would be a nice line because the residuals are fairly small. Normally we want them to be small in a least square sense, uh, but we could also do uh, other things. Now there's a solution for this. Uh, it's kind of old, the least square solution. And uh, I'll assume that you are familiar with that. So basically, formally what we want to do is that we want to find a B that minimizes the sum of the squared residuals. 
And the solution, uh, which should be familiar to everyone, uh, is this one. Uh, so that's how we can solve uh, for B if we don't have a perfect um, uh, solution. So that's the principle of uh, linear regression. We often use that in chemistry for uh, doing calibration, for predicting concentrations. We could take um, observations at a certain wavelength in a, in a spectrum uh, and use uh, for building a calibration model. We could also use uh, two wavelengths if, if we wanted to go a little bit crazy. So then we would have two regression coefficients. Now, if we do have two uh, regression coefficients, how many observations do we have to have? Well, since we have two unknowns, we really need to have uh, two uh, equations. Here's an example. So, for example, uh, let me see here. This could be row 1 and row 2, observation 1 and observation 2. So with two observations, I can solve, uh, uh, solve for two unknowns, um, for example. And I can put them in a little matrix uh, so you can see the relation to our standard notation. And this could really be anything. It doesn't have to be... Uh, uh, wavelengths. It could be any kind of parameter that we wanted to predict from two other sets of uh, parameters. And it doesn't have to be two either. We could have as many uh, solution, uh, as many um, parameters as we would like. So it could be a hundred different variables. That would just mean that we have a hundred columns in our x and we would solve for a hundred dimensional regression vector. That's what we call MLR, multiple uh, linear regression. And the solution to this one uh, should also be uh, familiar to you. It's very similar to the univariate uh, case. Okay, one final thing that I would like to uh, discuss is what we do when we have offsets in our data. Now, when you look at this line here, it's more or less going through uh, 0, 0.0, so we don't have a problem. But imagine that we had something like this. Now, if I try to fit this model to this data set here, that's not going to work very well uh, because that will force the line to go through 0, 0.0, which is not what we want. We would like to have a line that goes through uh, all the points, more or less, at least as much as possible. And that basically means we have to have an offset in our data. So how can we do that mathematically? Well, it's not too difficult, actually. We can add another column to our data set with just ones. Because you will see, if you do the calculations here, that if I add a column of ones, that will actually give me an offset to each and every uh, equation, to each and every row here. So that's basically how we handle offsets normally in uh, MLR, by just adding a column of ones. And that's a fine method, uh, but we actually do not use that in uh, PLS. So, so let me show you how we handle offsets in PLS. It's just a different approach. There's nothing uh, sort of uh, better or worse about the two different methods, uh, but it's, uh, it's just another way that we usually handle the offsets. So if we have a case like this one, where we clearly have an offset, what we will do is that, first of all, we are going to center all our x values. So from every x value, we are going to subtract the average of the uh, values. And that's going to move the x values so that they're centered around 0. And then we're going to do exactly the same uh, with the y's. And if we do that, then we move the data uh, to this particular, uh, uh, I mean, to, uh, around, to be around 0, 0.0. And what you will note then is that now the points are kind of going through 0, 0.0. So now we don't have to add an offset anymore. So by centering both X and Y, we don't need to do any centering because there will not be any offset in the data. And this is basically how we normally handle uh, offsets when we do uh, calibration models when we do PLS or similar models. Now, 
this also shows you that you really have to center both X and Y. It's not enough to center one of them. Uh, that's not going to do the trick. So if you do handle offsets this way, you have to center both X and Y. Okay, end of part one. Thanks.